No Knock Networking. How to Mitigate Network Attacks Before They Happen by Neil Krowitz presented by Chutney. Part 4, Full Stack Detection. Part 1 of this series covered the attack life cycle and a simple approach for mitigating attacks. If you stop the reconnaissance early, then the subsequent scans and attacks are never generated. Part 2 provided a few simple ways to hide from discovery attacks. If the attackers can't find your server, then they won't scan or attack your systems. And part 3 described more active solutions including reputation filtering, port scan detection, and packet profiling. These can be used to stop the connections before they can be used for attacks. This video will cover full stack detection and application specific content management. As a warning, this video goes really deep into network architecture. If you've never heard of the network stack, then this might be a significant learning curve. When you use your computer to access a remote web server, you're not connecting directly. Instead, the data from your computer may be relaying through lots of different network systems. And all these systems may use different communication protocols. When you connect to the web server, you are likely using a protocol called HTTP, a hypertext transport protocol. The HTTP data may be encrypted over TLS or transport layer security, which communicates over a protocol called TCP, which is routed to a network address using protocols like IPv4 or IPv6. And your initial connection to the internet may be over your local wireless network or through a wired cable. Notice how all of these protocols are layered. HTTP over TLS, over TCP, over IPv4, and over Wi-Fi. That's the network stack. There are different ways to represent the network stack. The ISO OSI standard describes a seven-layer model. It ranges from the physical layer at the bottom to the application layer at the top. Every layer provides a different set of support protocols. For example, the network layer provides addressing, and the transport layer directs data to specific services. Every layer also provides some kind of security option. Ideally, you want to use multiple layers of security. This way, if an attacker's packet makes it past one layer, it will hopefully be caught by a higher layer. The first two layers are located inside your local network. For physical defenses, you can restrict on-site access. At the data link layer, you can configure your routers to filter by the local machine addresses or MAC addresses. The other layers are for data that comes from outside your local network. Part 2 of this video series covered ways to block discovery attacks. These include ICMP filters at the network layer and TCP reset filters at the transport layer. Part 3 of this video series covered even more defensive options. Now we have layers of security. This is called defense in depth. But there are still two layers left. Those are specific to your server's applications. So what can we do to protect our web server? How about application profiling? There are some things that people at browsers do that bots rarely ever do. And there are some things that bots do that people never do. For example, we can look at the HTTP headers. Bots and attack scripts often include header fields that don't look like regular users. We can check the URL requests. We know every valid URL on our server and we can check for valid URL parameters. Regular users access known content with known parameters. Attackers often try to access things that are not on our server. We can also check for dependencies. All of our web pages include images, style sheets, and more. Regular users download all of this content. In contrast, web crawlers and attack scripts often skip these dependencies. If you don't download the style sheet or banner image, then you're a bot and we can check the web cookies and TLS session for any odd values. This is a great way to spot bots, hostile scripts, and man in the middle hijacking attacks. We can even look for complex patterns like timing attacks. No matter how fast a human clicks, a script can click faster. Humans also follow a linear pattern from link to link to link. Bots often collect all of the links and crawl them out of order. To give you a concrete example, this is a web request that our web server received. The user agent string says it is running Chrome version 34. That came out in 2014, but it's 2023 today. That's super old and not supported by anyone. Scripts often include fake user agent information in order to look like a legitimate web browser. However, script authors rarely update their user agent strings. This looks suspicious and could be an old user agent string that is used by a bot. The HTTP connection says it should close after one request. Browsers use Keep Alive. Scripts often use close, and the web client says it supports GZIP compression. 
Chrome 34 supports gzip, deflate, and broadly or br. This isn't Chrome. This is a script pretending to be Chrome. But it doesn't stop there. The request tried to post data to a URL that does not exist on the server. That's either reconnaissance or a blind attack. And our servers uses a different web form encoding method. And he included a cookie that didn't come from our service. That six big problems in one HTTP header. This looks like a bot or script from a hostile attacker. At this point, the server can restrict access, redirect access, or flag it for deeper logging. And we can do this before it ever reaches the web application. We can also watch the web logs for the server return codes. Some return codes are good, like 200 OK or 201 authorized. There are also good redirection codes, like 303 which is used for post login redirects, or 304 which helps with web content caching. But some codes are always associated with bad requests, like 404 not found, 401 unauthorized, or 403 forbidden. There are also bad redirections, like 301 and 302, which indicate that the web browser accessed a page that does not exist. When attackers iterate through their list of URLs for reconnaissance and blind attacks, every single request generates a bad code. On our servers, these are either a 301 redirect or 404 not found. But even if they access a URL that does exist, we always check the parameters. Every bad parameter returns a 301 or 404. And this is where fail to ban comes in. Fail to ban is a great piece of open source software and it's available for most Linux and Unix systems. This tool watches log files for patterns and counts the number of sightings over time. If an attacker crosses the sightings per time limit, then fail to ban works with your firewall to temporarily ban the offending client. We don't use most of the default fail to ban rules. Instead, Neil wrote a few special rules. One is called web bad. It watches the web logs for known bad codes. The first two rules match any bad 300 code. The third rule matches any 400 code. A regular user might hit a bad web page and see one bad return code. They might hit reload a few times and see a few bad return codes. A few bad codes in a few seconds isn't a problem. Attackers, on the other hand, often see lots of bad return codes rapidly. They cross the fail to ban threshold and get temporarily blocked. This doesn't stop the first few attacks, but it does stop the attacks from continuing. It stops future attacks. Another rule Neil created is called Slow Learner. It watches the fail to ban log and stops repeat attackers. As an example, last December we had an attacker who was crawling URLs. The web bad rule caught his scans and blocked him. After 15 minutes, the block lifted and he was gone. Good riddance. Except, a week later, the same IP address showed up again doing the same reconnaissance scans. Web bad caught him again. 15 minutes later, the block lifted and he was gone. Two days after that, he showed up doing the same thing again. This time, he scanned URLs and was banned. When the ban lifted, he resumed and was banned again. Fifteen minutes later, it lifted again, he resumed and was banned a third time. But this time, he triggered the slow learner rule. Rather than being banned for 15 minutes, he was banned for three days. When the ban lifted, he didn't return until over a month later. We can't make him go away forever, but we can quickly cut off his attacks and detour him from accessing the server. So let's put it all together. If you visit our website before you ever see the homepage, you have already gone through a full stack analysis. The server has automatically checked for port scanning, network reputation, TCP header analysis, HTTP header profiling, and much more. All of these checks took a fraction of a second. It runs in real time. Behind the scenes, the server performs a risk assessment based on these results. And depending on what the server found, you might see the home page. Or the home page with a capture. Or one of a dozen customized warnings or messages. Or you might just see a blank page and a word banned. That means the server doesn't want to play with you anymore. In the worst case, you won't even connect to the web server. This is reserved for clearly hostile web clients. These layers of defenses absolutely work in the real world. Beware the Ides of March. Last March, our web server saw a few network addresses performing very invasive scans. He wasn't just attacking one of our servers. He was attacking all of them. He was after our entire subnet. The packet profiling immediately identified his attack tools. He was using Nmap and Nessus to scan the servers. 
Each server immediately detected the scans and blocked the attacker. And when I say immediate, I mean at the first packet. Even though the attacks were blocked, the attacker was still trying to probe and scan every port on every server. This makes him a very determined attacker. We weren't concerned about him harming the servers. Heck, nobody was in the office when this started. We didn't learn that this had happened until an hour later. When we got to the office, we saw the alerts and looked up the attacker's IP addresses. In this case, the attacker's addresses did have a reverse hostname. It was some scanner name and ended with dhs.gov. DHS? That's the US Department of Homeland Security. Why was DHS scanning our servers? If you've worked in the security field for more than a year, then you probably know someone who knows someone. Neil reached out to one of his friends who has contacts at DHS and asked him to ask them what was going on. We really expected to hear back within days, but got a reply 30 minutes later. That's not just DHS. That's a small branch of DHS called CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. CISA is a shining light of hope within DHS. They are really good people. Among other things, they provide a cyber hygiene service. Network services and critical infrastructure providers can ask CISA to evaluate their network for free. CISA will then provide a report about your vulnerabilities. The idea is herd immunity. The more secure your network is, the more secure we all are. The problem is, we didn't ask CISA to scan our servers. The long story short, our service provider had asked CISA to scan them and forgot to provide our network range as an exclusion list. They have the right to scan their network, but not the right to scan our servers. CISA stopped scanning our servers within minutes of being contacted on our behalf. We don't blame CISA for this, this was just a communication oversight. But since they did scan our servers, Neil thought. Hmm, so, what did they find? CISA graciously provided us with a list of their findings. Oh my god. Our honeypot is wide open. It has lots of known risks. The web server returns password files. The mail server accepts relaying. And much more. Perfect. This is exactly what we wanted the honeypot to look like. On one of the servers, CISA found that we support HTTPS with TLS 1.1. That's an old version and should be disabled. However, we have a client who needs it, so this is intentional. Unfortunately, they didn't find anything else on the server because their web scan looked suspicious and was automatically blocked. For our other servers, they found nothing. At all. Their initial port scans caused them to be locked out. This is exactly what Automated Layers of Defenses is designed to do. It stops some attacks before they happen and cuts off ongoing attacks before they can compromise the system. But why stop there? We can still do more. It does not matter if you run a web server, social network, online gaming platform, or a dark and dystopian media outlet. As long as users can upload content to your site, you need to moderate content. Otherwise, your service will become a troll farm. Most sites have well-defined terms of services. Users who violate your terms of service are effectively attacking your service. Fortunately, there are often patterns associated with content moderation, and that can be automated. For example, the Photo Forensic Service permits people to upload pictures. It currently receives over 800,000 unique pictures per year, and that rate increases every year. However, as a public service, it prohibits some types of content. No porn. No pictures of ID cards. No receipts, no driver's licenses, and so on. Despite having this in the terms of service, it still regularly receives prohibited content. Being a content moderator should be a full-time job. But as we've mentioned, we don't have a full-time admin. So, we automated it. The server has automated detectors for ATM receipts, identity cards, known prohibited content, known child porn, and things that are likely porn. There are some common things that people do to avoid bans. If it detects someone working around a ban, then it bans them again. And we have lots of other detectors. So when Neil wakes up, he has breakfast and then checks the server logs. And we can see that, while Neil was away, the server caught an ATM receipt, a Swiss passport, another ATM receipt, a British driver's license, a Vietnamese ID card, and so on. The system automatically moderated content without any humans being near the office. All of this is customized for our services. Your systems run different applications, so you will need different customized detectors. But maybe this will get you thinking. Rather than putting people in reactive knock roles, have them focus on proactive defensive solutions.
our philosophies. Forget the knock. Use automated defenses. If it can be automated, then it should be automated. What I've covered is a fraction of what the servers detect. By nesting these roles, we've created a fully automated expert system. That's a type of AI. It identifies and stops attacks before they happen. And it detects and blocks ongoing attacks. Because it is completely automated, it is faster and more effective than any human in a knock. When we get to the office, we see the alerts from the expert system and can choose to take additional manual steps long after the attack was stopped. Full stack profiling reduces the need for a hands-on response. Rather than having a room full of administrators, you can use a skeleton crew and no dedicated staff. It also reduces the amount of noise in your logs. You might remember the big target compromise from 2013. Someone compromised their servers and stole a bunch of credit cards. It wasn't that they lacked logs showing the attack. The problem was, their logs had so much noise that they didn't notice the attack. Reducing attacks reduces the junk in the logs, so important attacks are more likely to be noticed. Full stack profiling also has the great side effect of saving you money. With fewer attacks, you save bandwidth and require less human overhead for managing the network. This leads to lower associated expenses. On our servers, those generic attacks, where they want to attack everyone, have almost entirely stopped. And those targeted attacks, where they specifically want your system, those attacks now stand out. Remember, it takes time for them to develop custom attacks. These automated defenses stop most of the scans and probes, dramatically slowing down their development process. Now our logs and alerts show these dedicated attackers as they are developing their attacks before the vulnerabilities can be weaponized. Often, we can identify and patch the problem before they can exploit our server. I want to warn you. These automated defenses do not make you invincible. There are too many attackers, they are too motivated, and there are new vulnerabilities coming out daily. You need to patch your systems. But what these automated defenses do is stop some of the attackers. It discourages others, and it slows down the rest. Moreover, everyone left is now very visible in the logs. This type of system also needs ongoing maintenance. Your reputation list and packet profiles need to be updated regularly. And maybe you need to create new filters based on new attacks that appear in your logs. But the catch is, you can do this maintenance on your own schedule and not in response to an immediate danger. So to wrap up this talk, you can stop attacks before they happen. Attacks require reconnaissance. By stopping the recon, the subsequent scans and attacks never follow. We do this using indicators of intent. It is fully automated, and there is no knock required. I hope this has given you some good ideas for protecting your own systems. On behalf of Neil Crowitz and Hacker Factor, we thank you for your time.